being the last night of this gospel meeting effort, I would be remiss if I did not take a few moments to express my appreciation once again for the invitation that was extended to me to come and present these series of lessons to you. I'm thankful to the elders, the confidence that they showed in me to do this inviting. I'm grateful to the members here for all the good things you've done for me, all the things that you have offered me throughout the course of this week. It's truly been a blessing and a privilege. Um, there's been so many good things that have been done from a standpoint of the food that was provided to get with you, to interact with you, to be able to get better acquainted with some of you. That, those are things that I cherish, that I'm really appreciative of. The association we have as brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we should never take that for granted. And, and to be able to interact in this way is something that we should look toward from the perspective of being built up and strengthened and encourage, uh, appreciate the fights and uh, time we spent together and being with Jerry, uh, having that opportunity. I've always appreciated his work and the efforts he's put forth. And so from those standpoints, I, I'm built up by such opportunities that I have to hear from you and the encouraging things you've said to me as we've gone through the course of this week. It, it really does help me. It, it energizes me. I mentioned about the fact that my wife cannot be here because she's working. Well, one of us had to work. And I don't really consider this work. I mean, it's effort, uh, but it's not really work. I, I don't look at it from that standpoint. It's a tremendously wonderful opportunity. And as a consequence, for you to extend this to me is something that I'm genuinely grateful for. And I hope and pray and trust it's been helpful and profitable to you. I, I, I want us to view how we go through life in a way that really prepares us for an eternity. And indeed, that's kind of the beginning point that I want us to think about this evening. As we think about the series of lessons we've been looking at, God-centeredness and being God-centered. We reflect upon the idea that we're to be God-centered as opposed to being man-focused. And, and truly, we can reduce everything down to that proposition. I'm fully persuaded that that's the case. Really, we're either going to be God-centered or we're going to be man-focused. And if you look at it as it relates to our life, as we talked about that, as it involves our family, as it involves the church, as it entails our decisions that we make, as, as we consider all the different facets and aspects of life, being God-centered really directs us in everything we do. When we're man-focused, we're actually veering off from what we should be doing and how we should be acting and what we need to be doing in our lives. I want us to consider then, as we kind of come to the conclusion, the results. The results of being God-centered. Uh, and as we think about that idea, we're tested to ensure that we're God-centered, as we talked about last night. We, we need to evaluate ourselves to ensure that we're being God-centered. We need to look into that perfect law of liberty as that which directs our lives. We recognize that there are difficulties and challenges and trials that come upon us in this life, and that we can truly, if we're not careful, be in our way of approaching things, diverted from what we need to be doing and how we need to be conducting ourselves. And so now we think about the results of God-centeredness. And the culminating result of God-centeredness is that heavenly home. We need to keep our eyes on that goal, to focus upon that. We had the songs that were being led this evening, Joe leading us in songs, and I appreciate the man who led the singing throughout the course of this week. It's always wonderful to blend our voices together. We're teaching and admonishing one another. We're not just praising God. We're teaching and admonishing one another. And we sing those songs about heaven and, and thinking about heaven and, and reflecting upon that heavenly home. I, I talked some about suffering last night, the context of being tested. One thing that I didn't really emphasize that I want to point out at this time is the fact that one reason why suffering and the hardships that we encounter one thing that it helps us with is keeping our focus upon what's truly important, that God's centeredness and making heaven our eternal abode because this life is not our home and we should not be desirous of trying to stay here forever. We can't do it anyway. It's not possible. But our mindset ought to be of looking beyond this life and as we go through life and say there's suffering, there's hardships, there's difficulties. You know, there's something greater and grander and more blessed that awaits us. And God is reigning and ruling in heaven, and we'll be with God for an eternity. So we think about the results. The culminating result is heaven and the songs we sing. And I want to ask this question, and we're going to then look at it again from God's word. And this question 
kind of helps us with thinking about heaven, and more importantly, who's going to be in heaven. We want to be there. So what do we need to do in order to accomplish that? And that God-centeredness is what we've been talking about, not man-focused. But are all good people going to heaven? Now, I could take, perhaps take a survey and go through, and we could ask every one of us that particular question, and uh, we might get varying answers, frankly. Some may say yes, some may say no, and somebody says, well, well it depends. Because it really it's kind of what we're thinking about when we say good. What do we mean by good? And so I've phrased it in the form of this question, and we really need to think about this idea of good and the concept of good, because the world thinks in terms of good in one way, and the Bible speaks of it in a different light. And so we think about this. It depends on what one means by good. So as we pursue this thought, and as we look at it, I've got a survey. I could survey you, but let's look at a poll that actually has taken place over a number of years. When I was putting this together, I came across this particular survey, and I thought it was intriguing. Uh, somewhat insightful as how people think and how they look at this idea of being good. There's a tendency to believe if a person is generally good or does enough good things for others during his lifetime, they will earn a place in heaven. In, in 2007, the public decided on the matter. 54% agreed, 38% disagreed. This represents a little change since 2002, when 55% agreed and 38% disagreed. 1996, when 54% agreed and 38% disagreed. Or 1993, when 56% agreed with this notion. This is from the Barna Research Poll. They've done this over a number of years, and they're kind of giving us information. I came across this, and I thought that was very interesting. What do most people think? Well, good people are going to go to heaven. That good people, the doors are going to be open. An individual, as long as he is good, he will be in heaven. And the way they mean that is different from what the scriptures have to say about the matter. And you, if you were to ask them to define what is good, they'll give varying views, but it really boils down to the idea of what they consider being good. Morally upright, perhaps. An individual that does good things from a standpoint of his life. He's good to his friends and his neighbors. And you've got all these different ideas that are presented. But what constitutes being good? They say if you're good, you're going to heaven. Are all good people going to heaven? Well, let me pursue this then a little additionally and ask some further questions. What about the good Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim? Uh, is the good Buddhist, Hindu, or Muslim going to heaven? I remember one time when a number of years ago, my mother had a neighbor out where she lived that had a number of conversations and discussions about religion. And my mother felt that they had made some great strides, that they had really had some good conversations about the matter. And so when I was visiting, she wanted me to have an opportunity to get acquainted with this neighbor and talk to her son. And I'm certainly glad to do that. We got together and we began to talk and discuss, and it became pretty apparent to me that her ideas didn't match what the Bible has to say about different biblical subjects. That, that she had these very kind of vague concepts, and that as we pursued it a little bit more, she finally got to the point when she started saying, well, yeah, she thinks all good people go into heaven, which is not something that we would be um, surprised by that, that that survey illustrated that that's the case. The poll kind of identifies so many people who have this concept. And so you have her saying, well, all good people go into heaven. So I asked her, what about the good Hindu or the good Buddhist? And she paused there for a minute. I don't think she'd ever been asked a question like that, but she, to be consistent, said, uh, well, uh, yes. Of course, we were having a little trouble finding out what that good really constituted. And so my mother was taken aback. She was surprised by this. Because when they talked about religion in this way, until you get down to specifics, until you kind of get into the point of looking at it in application to our lives, some people can sound awfully good when they talk about religion, but what does it really mean to them? And how is it going to be applied in one's life? Well, in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, this only begotten Son, whoever believed on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's talk about the Son, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, when God in times past spoke to the fathers through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us through his Son, so the Son, Jesus Christ, well, the Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, they don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe it's the Son of God. They deny Him. They reject Him. So if one, however one defines good, are any of these that follow and pursue these religious beliefs going to go to heaven? 
Well, what about the good atheist, agnostic, or skeptic? I asked the lady, I said, what about the agnostic? What about the atheist? You know what an agnostic is? He's a cowardly atheist. <laughs> he, he, an atheist says there is no God. The agnostic says, I don't know. But they live their life as if there is no God. They just don't want to defend a position. But they deny God. The skeptic puts out there this concept and, and questioning about God and things pertaining to religion. What about these individuals that would identify themselves this way or others who would acknowledge them as being agnostic or atheist or skeptic? Well, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Can we deny God and go to heaven? In John 1, 1 through 3, you have the Word. It talks about the Word from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It continues on and describes the Word, and the Word finally in verse 14, robed in the flesh, coming to this earth. God in the flesh, Jesus coming and being identified to us as who He is and what He's done for us is in the Scriptures. So when you ask somebody about the atheist, and the agnostic, or talk about them, uh, what about those that would be const uh, constitute this idea of being good? Well, they equivocate a little bit sometimes. But to be consistent, they have to say, well, whatever we identify as being good, if they're like that, then shouldn't they go to heaven? Even if they deny that heaven exists or that there is a God. There was one time when I was watching one of those daytime programs where you have uh, the individual, you know, come on with a panel and the panel discussion is taking place and you have those individuals that are talking about different matters and they had a, several men who were religious in belief. And as they were going through this, and maybe you remember this fellow, Phil Donahue. Phil Donahue kind of, he, he was the four, uh, one that sort of began this format in which you go along and you have somebody there and you ask them questions and you get the audience involved in it, uh, preceded all these others, Oprah, for example. So I was watching that one time. So this goes way back because he hasn't had a program in quite a bit of time. But I'm watching this and I was curious because of the subject matter. And as they were talking about these various things of moral nature, and these individuals were standing for what was right in this particular instance, even though we'd have differences doctrinally with them, these various ones of denominations, but they were advocating what was correct. And so Phil Donahue gets to a certain point, and rather arrogantly, he's over there in the audience as he's been talking to them, he says, you know, when it comes time for everybody before uh, God, and they're going to be judged before God, and he says, you know, I just see God. I just think God's just going to open up the pearly gates. He's just going to swing them wide open. He says, just every one of you just come right on in. Everybody comes on in. Because that's, that's God. God's going to just allow everybody through the pearly gates. Nobody's going to be excluded. And the audience just started applauding. And I shouted at the TV. Now, shouting at the TV doesn't do much good, but it made me feel better. I said, okay, let's try this. You know what's interesting? In a general way, that sounds really quite compassionate and wonderful and loving and caring and gushy and all that other kind of good stuff, right? So let's uh, audience, what about this? Hitler's at the pearly gates. Oh, come on in, Hitler. How many people would applaud? Or Stalin, some other notorious character in history, Genghis Khan. What about these individuals who murdered hundreds of thousands of people in some instances, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? What about the mass murder that maybe not quite to that extent, but oh, we're just going to let them in? See, suddenly they wouldn't be quite as receptive to that idea. They're not going to be applauding. Hitler going into the pearly gates, because we, Hitler's got to be excluded. And here's my point. Well, I think that Phil Donahue was simply throwing that thing out there, and he didn't have any real belief religiously concerning these matters. He, he kind of put the, wanted to put those religious people on the spot and have the audience to kind of have this disposition. Look, we're, we're more noble than they are. We're more caring than they are. That type of situation. But as you, as you look at, at, that, at that matter and, and consider these ideas of allowing people into heaven, once you exclude one person, then you've already made a standard. you set a standard here and you've drawn a line. So if Hitler can't go in, then all mass murderers can't go in. Now, who's made that determination? Well, man did. I, I understand the scriptures teach that that's wrong and sinful, and so these individuals can't go in. But I'm talking about from a standpoint when you say everybody can go in, and now all of a sudden you're going to exclude some. Well, who is it that decides who's going to be excluded? And you start looking at that line. People are going to have a varying view of it. Let me tell you something. I am so very thankful that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to be the one 
that is going to judge us on, the, on that day. And that it's not a man. Because, see, sometimes we bring our prejudices into the play, our likes and dislikes. And uh, This person, he, he may not have been so kind to me, and I'm going to exclude him. This other individual, he's my friend. It doesn't matter. I want them to come in. That's the approach that we would tend to. The Lord Jesus is going to judge us absolutely correctly, impartially. And we should be thankful for that because he's given us a standard and we know what that standard is and we can live by that standard and we know and have absolute confidence that if we do those things with the right attitude and proper disposition of heart, he's going to, having saved us, he's going to provide that eternal place for us to spend that period of everlasting life with God and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and all those blessings that are associated with it. So you look at this. Who's good? Let me talk about some examples of good men that you find in the Bible. These are unquestionably good people. Well, here's about the rich young ruler. I'm going to have a chance to read some verses uh, as we look at this. I encourage you to turn to Matthew 19. I'm just going to start talking about this. I know we're familiar with this individual that we often identify as the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus, and he has a question. What do I need to do to obtain eternal life? An excellent question. You can't ask a more important question than that. What do I need to do to obtain eternal life? And so Jesus asked him, okay, about following these various commands that you have in the law of Moses and all these moral types of characteristics that are to be evident in one's life. And when you look at what's stated there, it's very commendable. His reply, he says, I've done all these things from my youth. It really is demonstrating of an individual who is morally upright and good. And you, and you look at this person, and it's hard to find a flaw with him. It's hard to, uh, to be able to identify or be able to observe anything that is wrong in his life. Because when it describes this one throughout, he's, he's certainly a commendable character in every respect and every way. And I'll just note in verse 18, just to kind of highlight this idea of those things that Jesus said. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. He said, I've done all these things from my youth up. He also asked an interesting question that we're going to look at further and momentarily. He says, what else do I lack? But here's the rich young ruler. Would you consider this person a good man? What about Cornelius? While you kind of keep your hand there in Matthew 19, I would ask you to turn over to Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, we're going to read here, Cornelius, Cornelius, as we recognize, the first Gentile convert. Uh, Peter is going to come to him. He's going to, Cornelius is going to be told to send for him and for him to come. But at this point in time, I want you to, as we read together, note the commendable character of Cornelius. Then there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day he saw clearly a vision, an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Is he a good man? When you consider this individual, you know, looking at this, wouldn't it be wonderful for that characterization to be applied to us? <laughs> that, that what's described here about Cornelius, uh, it, it's, it's certainly commendable in every facet, in every respect. You turn then and look a little bit further at Saul, later to be the Apostle Paul. We read about Saul, Paul, in Acts 23 and verse 1, he said, lived in all good conscience before men to this very day. That's a pretty impressive statement when you think about it, to have lived in all good conscience. My conscience didn't bother me about what I've done, the things I've engaged in. I've lived in all good conscience before God and before men. The things I did, I'm absolutely convinced were right, and to that sincerity is certainly evident, as Paul states that before these individuals that he's speaking to on that occasion. I've lived in all good conscience. Again, every single one of these things, wouldn't it be wonderful to have said about us or we could say about ourselves? So are these good men? Well, on one level, one would say, yes, they're good men. Uh, everybody would look at them and be able to praise them, to acknowledge these good and wonderful characteristics. But let's look at it a little bit more closely. He was morally upright but covetous. That's the rich young ruler. 
the thing that struck me through the years when you read this account, going back to Matthew 19, the latter part of verse 20, he says, what else do I lack? Have you ever wondered why he asked that question? You know, first he goes to Jesus and he says, what do I need to do in order to obtain eternal life? An excellent question. Jesus gives him a reply and he says, I've done those things. So, wouldn't it be natural for the person to say, okay, that's what's been told, and I'm doing those things, so oh, I'm all good, everything's fine, and I can go away reassured. But he didn't do that, did he? He says, what else do I lack? I'm convinced that this rich young ruler, for all these commendable attributes that he had in his life, realized that there was something that wasn't right. And that's the reason he asked the question. He was hoping Jesus wouldn't say, Anything other than, oh, it's all good, you're fine. But there had to be within him a certain understanding that there was something not quite right and that there was something still yet needful. Or at least Jesus needed to reassure him further because he had some doubts. And I don't, as I consider it, have any qualms about suggesting that the doubts he had were the very thing Jesus pointed out to him. Because don't you think that he knew himself pretty well and that recognized that he had this love for what possessions he had, the material possessions and the wealth that he had, and that his trust was really there? I'm, I'm confident that was the case. Because he asked, what else do I lack? And again, he hoped Jesus say, no, you're good to go. But instead, Jesus went ahead and told him that there was something yet lacking, which he kind of had... And himself had thought that was the case. So in the 19th chapter, I want to pick up with verse 21. The young man said to him, All these things I've kept from my youth, what shall I lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, that is complete, whole, fully mature, go sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So his treasure is going to be in heaven. You, you get rid of all these worldly possessions and treasures and you'll have treasure in heaven and you come follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus goes on and describes then that it's hard for a rich man to go to heaven. It's not impossible. Nothing's impossible with God, but it's hard. Why is it difficult? Because we put our confidence in our wealth. We put our trust in our material possessions. We feel that we're in a position to be able to go about and make our own choices and decisions with great confidence, and we don't have to rely upon anybody else, including God. We don't have to look to the Lord because we have all these advantages in life. So Jesus told him what was precluding him from being right with God. He was covetous. He, he had this desire to hang on to these worldly possessions. And he went away sorrowful. What a sad commentary. An individual going away sorrowful. He had in his hands the opportunity to go and have eternal life. And that was what Jesus was saying. He asked the question, why do I need to have eternal life? What is, is required of me? Jesus gave him the answer and he turned his back upon that answer. And he went away sorrowful. What about Cornelius? He was truly devout, but lost. When you look, of course, in the 10th chapter of Acts, which we noted earlier, this is the account where Peter is sent for. We have Peter then also uh, being instructed to go. And the events that transpired there, we'll not go into all the particulars, but suffice it to say that Peter goes as he's instructed. Cornelius did as he was told. Peter comes to him and then he teaches him. Now, up to this point, what is Cornelius' spiritual condition? He was devout. He feared God. He had a reverential respect. He gave of his alms. He prayed continuously. In fact, he was commended for, by the Lord for that, those attributes themselves. He was actually told what a wonderful uh, disposition of heart you have and behavior and conduct that you exemplify and how you go about your life. But in the 11th chapter of Acts, and I wanted to skip to the 11th chapter because this is where Peter and those that had accompanied him are having to give an explanation of why they went to a Gentile to teach the Gentile. Uh, Peter himself had to be convinced that he needed to go to the Gentiles, not exclusively to the Israelites, uh, to the Jews. And so we find then that that explanation is offered and in the course of describing this, he tells what the condition of Cornelius was prior to his coming and speaking to him, at that point of coming to him. And so we pick up verse 13 here of the 11th chapter. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in the house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. 
who will tell you words by which you and your household will be saved. You need to hear those words of what he needed to do to be saved. As commendable of a character as he was, he was in a lost condition. When we look then at Saul, Paul, he was sincere but in sin. In Acts the 8th chapter, it's the start of the 8th chapter, of course you can look back to the 7th chapter as well, when we're first introduced to Saul, the persecutor of the church, as we would identify him early on, as the scriptures would describe him. He's holding the cloaks of those who are stoning Stephen. He's participating in that endeavor or activity in which Stephen is being stoned to death. We see that he it was that he picked this up and began to persecute the church, so much so that as he's going about, it raised uh, havoc within the church. The Christians were being persecuted, and he was doing this devoutly, energetically, having absolute confidence that he was doing what was right. He believed he was serving God. And, of course, we read about in Acts chapter 9 when he's going on the road to Damascus, when the light shone down about him, he sees the risen Savior, the Lord, speaking to him, tells him to go on into there into uh, Damascus, where he, he would be instructed what he needed to do. You, you have here this one, and how would you describe him? How, how would you talk about Saul and his behavior and conduct? What would you call him from a standpoint of the sinful behavior he engaged in? Well, let me tell you one thing he was. He was a murderer. Saul was a murderer. He put to death innocent people, Christians, children of God. He thought he was doing what was right. He thought he was upholding God's will, but he was doing something that was contrary to the teaching and instruction of the Lord, which we obviously recognize. So he's a murderer. He says he was the chiefest of sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15. And, of course, he used himself as an example. If I can be saved, being the chiefest of sinners, then the gospel is for everyone, and everyone has the opportunity to be saved. If what I've done, as reprehensible as it was, in persecuting the church and putting to death Christians, then everyone can come to Christ on his terms. That's the point he's making. So what has sincerity got to do with the equation? Well, sincerity doesn't make one right. You can be sincerely wrong. Now, I'm not discounting sincerity. I think sincerity is absolutely essential as it relates to how we conduct ourselves and being pleasing before God. What we need to do is be sincere and do what is right. And one who's sincere is more apt to be receptive to the teaching and instruction they receive. But sincerity does not make one right with the Lord. And you go through and you look, there are a lot of individuals who kind of point to this idea of sincerity and say, well, but he's just really sincere. Yes, but my question is, is he right? Is he doing what's right? And how do I know what that is? Well, turn to the book. We open up the scriptures. The scriptures tell us what the Lord expects and requires and demands of us. So every single solitary individual that we're looking at here, the rich young ruler, Cornelius, Saul, later to become the apostle Paul, all of them, at least in some people's definition, would be good. But in every single case, they were not good from the standpoint of how God saw them and their spiritual condition before him. They all had something that was lacking and needed to change. Two of them changed and one didn't. Two of them were receptive to what they needed to do, and one went away sorrowful. And, and let me tell you something. That's truly the situation that everybody's confronted with. At some point in time, that here's the Word of God. You've got two different ways in which you can approach that. You can either humbly submit, and do what you're instructed to do, to then be in a right relationship with the Heavenly Father, or you can go away and turn your back upon Him. And whether it's sorrowful or whether you've done it in... Uh, defiance, however you view that, the consequences are exactly the same. The situation is the same. So these examples are good men. Now, examples teach that, now let's look at this, and we're going to reinfor reinforce this. God defines what is or who is good, not man. There are a number of verses of Scripture we're going to take note of. Uh, just briefly kind of look at this idea, because good is referred to extensively in Scripture. The word is used. And in so doing, we can grasp the idea of good and what that means and from a spiritual standpoint and from a, the perspective of whether or not we're right with the Lord. In, in 3 John, and here in verse 11, as 
we, we find uh, the, the reference to these things. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Now notice what it says. Now how do I know what's evil and what's good? It goes on, he who does good is of God, but he who does evil is not, has not seen God. So it's equated with God. And, and, and then to be one that adheres to and follows after and does the teaching and instruction of God, that's what constitutes good. The opposite of that is evil. In Titus, the third chapter, Titus also gives us some additional information. Paul, as he writes to Titus, gives us some additional information as it pertains to this idea of good. We know there, this is a faithful saying. And though these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to man. We're to maintain good works. And again, you take a look at this idea of good. So he identifies for us good, being good ourselves, good works that we're to engage in. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 10. And I'm going to take just a moment to back up in these verses before we look at verse 10. Because the... Preceding verses are often used by individuals, or at least those that I've encountered, to try to point out that works are not necessary. You don't have to do any works. It's not something required of us. And many times they try to equate baptism with that being a work, and that's the reason they discount baptism as being essential. And if you look here, uh, they're certainly referencing to the idea of what the grace of God constitutes and what's involved in this matter. But in verse 8 of the second chapter of Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And there's the definition, grace, a gift of God, that unmerited favor. Not of works, in verse 9, lest anyone should boast. Well, that pretty well settles the matter, doesn't it? You read those two verses. It's not of works. The grace of God is taking care of these matters, and so you can discount works. When we read verse 10, we don't find a contradiction we find an explanation. In verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. If you're talking to your friends, uh, uh, they're a member of a denomination, believe in Calvinism, and they're talking about faith only, uh, when, if they are acquainted with the scriptures and some argumentation, they take you to this verse and they want to read verses 8 and 9, I would encourage you to take them to verse 10. Continue on with the reading and the context there. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, when I'm a recipient of the grace of God, that unmerited favor, that which I cannot do for myself, there's no work that I can do to merit my salvation. I, haven't, I can't have a list of things. I can't set up something and go through this and make my own works and kind of use that in order to say that makes me right with God. That's going to take care of me. That's going to provide all that I have need of. Well, no, it's God's works. He's given us, we're here as his workmanship, created unto good works. It's expectation that's required of us. He's prepared these things beforehand. He's set forth what is needful and necessary. And it's not a contradiction to talk about the grace of God and to talk about us being obedient to his will. Because how I am going to be able to reap his grace is through doing what he instructs me to do. It doesn't make my salvation one of merit makes my salvation one of obedience and humbleness before him and just doing his will. There are instances when you come across people that uh, have sort of had these ideas and, and they, they make a mockery, sadly to say, of what the scriptures teach. There was a, there's a, a guy, Schuler. you may be familiar with him. Uh, he, he was the one over in California in the Crystal Cathedral. He, uh, he had, had quite a bit of things to say. He, he would get up there and he put on quite a production. If you ever tuned in on a Sunday morning and you had the Crystal Cathedral and he had all these things set up. He ran in one time, just coincidentally, way back when, Paul Bear Bryant. And you may know him as the Alabama football coach. And, and the way he described this, and, and I think it's kind of instructive for us to sort of appreciate the distinction and, and, and what's required of us and what's needful. When he just talked about this himself, he talked about how he was in a plane and somebody came and approached him and he was kind of reading something and he heard his name and he just kind of buried himself and said hello and everything until he looked up and saw who it was. 
Paul Bear Bryant had a cigarette in his hand and a drink in the other hand that he'd gotten. He said, I, I saw you over here. My, my wife watches you and uh, Robert Schuler, you know, and, and I, I wanted to come over here and, and talk to you for a minute. And So they got to talking, he said, and they got to visiting. Of course, he was fascinated with this individual who's well known as this football coach, a legend. And as they discussed some things, it got to the point where his, the salvation issue came up. And Paul Bear Bryant said, well, you know, I, I just... I'm who I am. He says, I, I curse. I, I do these things. You know, of course, he had that drink and cigarette, and he was in that position and situation. He says, you know, I just, I, this, this is my life. He says, and, and this is the way I, I, I do it, and so I, I don't see where I have any hope. And so Schuler says, well, do you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God? And, and Brian said, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. He's, he says, well, here, give me something. He wrote down something on this paper, and he said, Bear Bryant saved, and he said, this punches your ticket to heaven, because you believe, That's, you believe. He, he actually told the story, Robert Schuller actually told the story one time on, on his program, and kind of describes, you've got your ticket punched to heaven. Forget what you do in life, I mean, once you have acknowledged that, then everything's fine. It makes a mockery, does it not, of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I don't have to change, I don't have to do anything different. I can behave just like I was previously, if that idea is true and correct. We are created by Him unto good works, to fulfill those things in our lives, to serve Him, to honor Him, to glorify Him. I no longer belong to myself, I'm owned by Him. I've been bought with the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me tell you the sad reality is, some years later, after the account, Paul Bear Bryant passed from this life. He's still a legend. But you know when he died, what his spiritual condition was? Robert Schuller, notwithstanding. That's sad. Sad company. When we have an opportunity to talk to somebody, do we want them to think it's okay to live as we want to live? Or do we want them to understand that the Scriptures teach us how we're to live correctly and rightly before Him and to honor Him, to do His will? In Colossians, the first chapter, in verse 10, and I'll use this one to then sort of capsulize again this idea of good, what constitutes good. We're going to build on this with the next point. And actually, I've kind of developed it somewhat already. But not that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So I'm increasing the knowledge of God in every good work. The works that He's given, we're to do. Salvation is not obtainable apart from Christ. It's not possible to do it. So all these individuals, no matter how they're designated by various ones, uh, what anybody thinks about or how they want to define good, apart from Christ, there is no salvation. In John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And no man comes to the Father except through Him. He's the way, the truth, the life. There's salvation, no other name. That's what we find in Acts the fourth chapter, verse 12 specifically. You can go back and look at the verses that precede that. But there's salvation, no other name. His authority that's set forth. I can't be saved through Buddha. I can't be saved through Confucius. Through any man's philosophies or ideas. Whoever we may look at, I... There's no salvation through these individuals. Their only salvation, the only means through whom we have salvation and eternal life is Jesus Christ. It's not obtainable through any other means, any other way. Being good doesn't forgive a person's sins. Rather, it requires obedience to the gospel. That's, that's how my sins are going to be remitted. Obedience to the gospel. Again, we can look at, I can talk about this, and, and sometimes we talk about, that's a, that's a good man. He's a good individual. And, and we use it in that way to express somebody who's morally upright. And that's commendable. We're, we're appreciative of people who are going to have a right disposition. There, there's some good characteristics about them. But again, when we look at the idea of, from the scriptural perspective, how is one saved and how is one going to be right with the Lord, it's going to be through obedience, through following those teachings and instructions that have been given to us. So you think about Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone who comes to that age of accountability, you get to this point, and all have sinned. Every one of us has sinned, and we're separated from God, and so we're lost. That's our condition and situation. In the sixth chapter of Romans, verse 23, 
It talks about for the wages of sin is death. That's spiritual death. We're separated from God. We die in our sins. We have eternal condemnation as a result of that. You know, I love to preach about heaven. And, and I do not like to preach about hell. But, you know, I can't preach about heaven without also mentioning hell. Because we're talking about eternal states. We're talking about where all men are going to spend eternity, everlasting circumstances in which they're going to find themselves, either in that blissful state, that heavenly home, or in constant uh, uh, suffering and pain and anguish that hell sets before us. So when we look at those alternatives, here I am in my condition and situation. If I die in my sins, I'm separated from God. I will be separated from God for an eternity in suffering all that time. In the first chapter, verse 16 and 17, where Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also the Gentile. He's not ashamed of it. You know, brethren, we have to be careful that we are not ashamed of the gospel. That we're not embarrassed because we're Christians. And that we get in situations and circumstances that take, take a stand, and it's a lot easier just to be quiet and allow things to go on and not to be forthright by pointing out that we are to live correctly and rightly before the Lord. And, and that's, it's just easier. And, you know, sometimes our lives are more like a river. Now, you look at a river, and it meanders here, there, and yawn, and it kind of swings this way, and it goes that direction, and it may, through the course of its movement, uh, travel, travel, and, and you look at it, well, why is it going this way? Why does it just take a straight line? Well, it's going through the, the direction of the, which it has the least resistance, isn't it? It's going through that where, where that gravity takes it. It's going where the, the flow is to follow it. And so our life sometimes is like that. We go with the direction of least resistance. And as Christians, we have to take a stand. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. We need to be prepared to stand forth and tell others about the Lord. Those around about us that, yes, I'm a Christian, and, and I, I want you to be one too. And when things are going along, and, and instead of participating in that which is wrong, and they're telling dirty jokes, or they're going, oh, no, I don't, I don't do that. That's not, that's not my behavior. I'm not going to involve myself with that. And people, well, oh, he's goody two-shoes. He thinks he's better than everybody else. You know, that kind of thing. You can think that type of ridicule. That's the kind of way in which people respond mockingly. Belittling, and, and you know we're kind of shy away from that. It's kind of a kind of a difficult thing. Nobody wants to be thought of in that type of way. We we all want to be thought of as, as a way in which people think, oh, what a good person, what a fine individual. I just really like that in person. You know what's interesting, and you probably have had the experience or know of circumstances in which these things have taken place. But in the workplace, you got these people that are running around together. They go off drinking at the bars, which the Christian doesn't do. You go telling the jokes or carrying on with certain activities and you have all this taking place and the Christian uh, separates himself from this and, and, and sets forth these things and they know they're different and distinctive. And then one of those people within that group suddenly has problems, some kind of difficulties and, and challenges and, and they're grappling with this situ circumstance of life and, and they're wondering what to do about these matters. And the people, they... The person they go to is not these friends they've been hanging around with and carrying on with. They go to this individual that's kind of kept himself apart. That's not going to behave this way because he has something distinctive and different and now I have a need and who am I going to get some answers from? Who's going to be able to help me with this situation? And they go to the Christian. That's happened a number, number of times that I'm aware of and familiar with. And out of that, several have become Christians as a result of that influence that we have. Being not ashamed of the gospel of Christ has great merit because, first of all, it's expected of us. It makes us what we ought to be, and it gives us the opportunity to be influential to those around about us and be a light into that world. In the 10th chapter, verses 11 through 16, and you can read that again, the context of it. I'll just simply make reference to what's being set forth there. It talks about the preaching and the teaching and sounding forth the word, the gospel. There's an interesting thing, and I would encourage you as just an exercise on your own, go through the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts. Um, and as you go through the book of Acts and you begin to look and see, how is the word communicated? Now, I realize that the Holy Spirit divinely guided the apostles and other ones who had these spiritual gifts. I recognize that, and you had the prophets, etc. But you know, 
the Holy Spirit didn't operate directly upon those that were non-believers. Not at any time, in, there was no situation in which the Holy Spirit operated directly. The angels had a part to play in giving the message of God, but the angels, what did they do? They went to the believers. Philip, for example, had both the Spirit and an angel instructed him when it came time to go to Philip to go to the Ethiopian. He gave him instructions to get there and then join himself to the chariot. Do you realize that in every instance in which conversion took place, it was a person, Christian, teaching somebody, another individual, in every single case. Wouldn't it have been easier if the Holy Spirit just simply came upon people and changed them? Taught them and they could have a choice? I mean, wouldn't have to automatically just force them to be changed, but wouldn't it be easier if the Holy Spirit came and said, I'm giving you this choice, I'm teaching these things, and just comes upon them and then you can choose whether to do that? Wouldn't it have been a lot simpler for Philip not to have made that journey that he did? If you look and see, he had to travel quite a ways in order to intersect where the Ethiopian was going from Jerusalem, coming down they, to intersect. It had been a lot easier for an angel to appear to the Ethiopian and say, here's what you need to do. Who was it that told Saul, later to become the Apostle Paul, what he needed to do to be saved? It wasn't the Lord. The Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus, didn't he? He shone down around about him. He talked to Saul. And he said, you're going into Damascus. And then you'll be told. You'll get what you need to hear there. And Ananias the preacher was sent to him to do it. And in the 22nd chapter of Acts, in verse 16, Ananias told him, while you're waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here was one that believed. He saw the risen Savior. He's one in prayer and fasting. He's waiting for that to hear what he needs to do. And Ananias told him, do you rise, you be baptized, and you wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Wouldn't it have been a lot easier for the Lord just when he had him right there and the light shining down? I want you to go be baptized. I want you to believe in me that you do. I want you to repent and stop going and doing these things that are reprehensible, including killing those that are my children. And, and I want you to you know, confess me before men, and I want you to be baptized. Why, why didn't the Lord just do it then? Have you ever wondered? Have you thought about that? Well, I'm convinced it's because that's our responsibility and duty, and the Lord gave it to us. And one of the tests, talking about last night, one of the tests to see if we are serving the Lord as we should, are we teaching others the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're the instruments to carry forth His word to a lost and dying world. Nobody else is going to do it. It's up to us to do it, and we are to be carrying the message. You know why we should do it? Not simply because we're commanded to do it, and we have the examples of them doing that, but because we care about the souls of individuals. I don't have to be forced to do something when I have the care and regard for others and I have a desire for them to know the truth because I'm concerned about them. I don't have to be commanded, though I am. I have a willingness and desire to accomplish that. And that we're an instrument to the Lord. Men have always taught men. The believers, the baptized in Christ, those individuals taught others. The Holy Spirit came and guided them orally. Now we have the written word. But it was always men teaching men. And that's still the case today. And you and I have the obligation to teach others what the Lord told us to do. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Maybe you've heard that before. It's, uh, I, I think it's a description that is absolutely accurate. Irrefutable to say it's a place for a prepared people. It's a prepared place. The Lord prepared it. He has made preparations for us that are a prepared people, that are doing His will. Nobody's going to get to heaven and say, well, I'm just really surprised I got there. No, nobody's ever going to, to, to look back and say, I wonder how that happened. That's not the way it works. If I don't prepare myself for heaven, I will not be in heaven. And I prepare myself by doing His will, following His instructions, humbly serving the Lord in my life. And then we're not surprised when we stand before the Lord on that day and hear, well done, that good and faithful servant, because we've been faithful in serving as we ought. It's a prepared place for a prepared people. So we conclude then with this question. Are you prepared? What is your condition spiritually this very evening? Do you know, we don't have a promise of tomorrow. We don't know what awaits this evening. The Lord may come again before tomorrow. We don't know when he's going to come again. He's going to come as a thief in the night, isn't he? 
And, and those that are paired when he comes, are, are, that's fine, that's great, that's wonderful. In fact, we rejoice at the fact that he's coming. And, and if he came tonight, wouldn't we be happy and glad and think what a wonderful thing now heaven awaits us? So, so the Lord may come again. He may not come again, but I, I may not make it through tomorrow. I'm going to be making a trip leaving tomorrow morning and heading back to Wichita. And as I'm traveling along, I may get in a wreck and be killed. I don't have any problems. I don't know what's going to happen necessarily. No matter how careful I may be, somebody be out there, they've been drinking, doing things, they come tearing across. You know, I've got to go through Dallas. There's going to be this football game that's over there, the Red River rivalry that they have in Texas and Oklahoma are going. There are a lot of crazy people over there at that time of year. And they're out there and they're doing all kinds of things and you, you're going through there. You know, I could die on the road. I would keep me in your prayers while I'm traveling, especially going through Dallas. You know, it's not how we die that matters. My preference is, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, my preference is I go to bed one night and I don't wake up. That's my preference. That's not necessarily how it's going to be. I don't know what the situation is, and whatever it is, I have to endure or go through whatever the case is in the right way in the proper manner. It doesn't matter how I die, whether I'm run over by a bus, if a nuclear bomb blew up and killed me, if I die of old age, that, it doesn't matter how we die, brethren, it's how we've lived. Because we're just sojourners in this life, we're just passing through. And we long for something greater and grander and better. We long for that place where there is no sorrow and death, no suffering, no decay. We long to be in heaven. And all of these things of this life are past. And the glory of heaven is our future if we are prepared by serving Him humbly, faithfully. Having the right attitude, the right disposition of heart, and doing His will in our lives. And He's made provisions for us. And he's made it so that we can do those things. And as we're about to sing this song of encouragement, as we think about this, my question is to you and to myself, are we prepared? If you're not... Anyway that you're subject to his call, won't you please come forward and make your quest known as together we stand the same.